Hey everybody, welcome back to NeuroSciQ, the best place on YouTube to increase your neuroscience IQ. Thanks for joining us for another week's video where we will be discussing emotions and how we perceive emotions from the facial expressions of another individual. So the reason why I came up with this topic for today's video actually came from inspiration during a recertification course I was doing for standard first aid. In the classroom, obviously we were all wearing our PPE and sitting six feet apart, but the instructor kept commenting about how she could tell we were happy and smiling just by looking at our eyes. And that got me to thinking, well, what's actually going on when we perceive other people's emotions? And is it really important for us to see the entire face or is it okay if we just see the eyes as we are now amidst the pandemic? So let's get right into it. Sit tight, stay tuned, let's roll the intro. Alright, let's start from square one. First of all, we have two people in a room. We have an observer and an actor. The observer will be looking at the actor, and the actor will be making a facial expression. Now, light will hit the actor, bounce off of them, and hit the back of the eye, which is called the retina. In the retina, there are a bunch of receptors called photoreceptors, photo meaning light, and then receptors meaning receptors, which pick up signals from the environment and help us discern what we are seeing. So all the light travels through the eye, hits the back, and then that information is carried to the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is at the very back of the brain, and this is an area particularly associated with vision. So a lot of times in intro psych, you will learn that the occipital lobe is the visual cortex. Now, once that information gets into the occipital lobe, we discern different things about the subject. So there's two streams. We are figuring out what the subject is, who they are, recognizing them, and we are then figuring out their emotion as well. So to figure out who somebody is, that information is relayed to the fusiform gyrus, which is part of the fusiform face area that helps us identify who people are. This is a particular area in the brain that only lights up when people look at faces. So you can look at a house, you can look at a car, you can look at a camera, anything, but that area won't light up unless you're looking at a face. So it's a specific area that is developed for us to identify people. And then that information is relayed to anterior temporal regions that help us figure out identity, the person's name, and their biography. So temporal regions often include the hippocampus, which is a memory area, and there are different theories about facial recognition. We'll actually talk about those in a different video in the near future. But today we're going to focus more on recognizing emotion in another individual. So for emotion, the visual information is sent to the superior temporal sulcus or the STS. And the STS looks at gaze, expression, it particularly looks at lip movement as well. So this information is then split up. It's split up to the intraparietal sulcus, which is important for spatial attention. It also gets sent to the auditory cortex, and the reason why that information is getting sent to the auditory cortex is for pre-lexical speech perception. So by looking at someone, if you see their mouth start to move, it helps tune in your auditory cortex for hearing what they're about to say. Helps you pay attention. And then, for the emotional part, the information is sent to the amygdala and the insula. The amygdala we've talked about a bunch as an emotional area that's tends to be associated with fear, but it is also associated with more positive emotions too, like happiness, surprise, stuff like that. 
And then the insula is more associated with disgust. So these are limbic areas, and limbic areas are emotional areas where we are getting information sent to. So that whole structure, that neuroanatomical structure, was summarized in a paper by Haxby in the 2000s. But what I want to talk more about today is how we can identify emotions from just the eyes. Since we're in a unique period of time where people are wearing masks and we have to rely on the information we get from someone's eyes only. We can't see their mouth and I know a lot of times we like to think that we are actually relying on the mouth to tell emotions. When you think of happiness, you think of a smile. When you think of sadness, you think of frowning. When you think of anger, you might have the furrowed brow and the stiff lip. But the lips and the lower half of the face were actually shown not to matter that much at all. Even though we pay attention to it and that might be the first thing that jumps to mind, we actually do a lot of our processing based off an individual's eyes. And if you give somebody a picture to look at and then follow their eyes and track their eye movements, most of their focus is actually going to be on the other individual's eyes and then some of it goes down to the lips. Before we move on, I just want to mention that there are seven universal emotions. So these are emotions that have been observed cross-culturally. And those emotions include happiness, there's sadness, there's disgust, there's fear, there's shock, there's anger, and then there is contempt. So these facial expressions are not different from culture to culture and you might think okay yeah that makes sense but a lot of times cultures develop differently and things like body language might vary but these emotions come across the same way. This has led to a theory that the facial expressions were actually evolved to help us adapt to those emotions. So in 2017 Lee and Anderson said well based on this theory that we have adapted these facial expressions to help us survive, maybe the reason why our eyes widen in things like fear and surprise is to let more light in, enhance the sensitivity, and help us be more vigilant in these situations where we would be afraid or we would be surprised. They also said maybe then when we are disgusted or angered, our eyes narrow to let in less light and create a sharper focus since we are honing in on that one thing that we're disgusted by or that one thing that angers us. Another thing one of my psychology professors said is with disgust, when your nose wrinkles, maybe it's to prevent the odor from entering your nose and close the nasal passages because that odor could be harmful, it could be poisonous. Now these are theories but they went on to predict that people read mental states based on features shaped by sensory function. So they particularly wanted to look at the eyes and they were basically saying we read emotions based on the fact that we adapted to respond in a certain way. So then they looked at the eyes and they said, okay, there are probably six things that we can tell from somebody's facial expressions on their eyes. We can look at their eye aperture, which is the distance from top to bottom. So if it's wide or narrow, we can look at the eyebrow slope. Is the eye, are the eyebrows straight? Are they angled up? Are they angled down? Like when you're angry or when you're surprised. You can also look at eyebrow curvature, the nasal wrinkle, like I said before, with disgust. Also wrinkles temporally and wrinkles below the eyes. A lot of times when people smile, their eyes will wrinkle and you can tell they're happy even without seeing their face. And then we come into the thing about the fake smile where people will smile and nothing happens on the upper portion of their face because it's not actually the real emotion, they're just smiling for the camera. So in the study, Lean Anderson actually looked at students from U of T and these were undergrad students. If maybe you're an undergrad student or at one point you were an undergrad student, you'll know that in psychology courses, a lot of the times it's required for you to be the guinea pig for course credit. So I had to do this, a lot of my friends that were in psych courses had to do this. In order to pass the class, you have to be a subject. 
So that was what was done. They recruited students for the study and 90% of emotional states were correctly identified just by looking at the eyes. And then they clustered these states and they found that there was four distinct clusters. There were sadness, disgust and anger, fear and surprise, and joy. So basically when people were getting things wrong, even if they were wrong, they were falling within the clusters of disgust and anger, or sadness, fear and surprise, or joy. Because they had a lot of different emotions, things like submission, things like uneasiness, which all fell into sadness, things like annoyance and aggressiveness that fell into disgust and anger. So emotions were clustering properly even though they were only looking at the eyes. Then they took the study further and they wanted to see, well, what happens now if we add the mouth? What's the difference going to be? And there actually was no difference. It seemed that even with the mouth present, students did just as well as they did without the mouth. So we can tell a person's emotion just by looking at their eyes. Then the researchers thought, okay, now what if we add the mouth in, but we make it do the opposite. So maybe the eyes are happy, but the mouth is angry. And we tell them, identify the emotion just by looking at the eyes. Well, the students still did well on this part of the experiment. Then they said, okay, now identify the emotion based on the mouth. And this was a incongruent situation where the eyes were happy and the mouth was sad. Most of the students actually did way worse on this part of the experiment because the eyes were throwing them off and it shows, it suggests that we rely on the eyes to discern emotion in an individual. Even if the mouth is present, what we look at for the most part are the eyes. Now if you're looking at the table and you're trying to figure out what it's showing, basically the top is with eyes only and the different score shows how, how much the scores for emotion varied based on if they were wide-eyed or if they were narrow-eyed scenarios. So there was a big difference between wide-eyed and narrow-eyed situations when we looked at just the eyes. There was still a big difference when we added the mouth. And then in the incongruent situation where they were relying on the eyes, they were able to do so pretty well still. And then when they were incongruent and told to look at the mouth, they started to do worse. Now why might this be happening? I think it's because you can get way more emotion from the upper half of the face anyway than the mouth. The mouth, you can look at the distance between the two corners of the mouth, any wrinkles that might happen around there. But with the eyes, you also have the eyebrows, you have the upper part of the nose, if they're masked maybe reveals part of their nose, you have the corners of their eyes, you have the wideness of their eyes, and that's way more expressive, especially the forehead, than being able to rely on just the mouth. So it's pretty interesting that with masks we can still see emotion, and there was a study that was done even back in 2017 that showed that this was possible. Anyway, I hope you liked the video, hope you learned something new, hope you have a fun fact that you can share with somebody next time you see them smile under their mask. That's all for today's video, thanks for watching, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you next week for future episodes right here on NeuroSciQ.